I'm Gary Miller. I work for the USDA's Systematic Entomology Laboratory at Beltsville, Maryland. I'm a research entomologist working on the aphidomorpha, which includes aphids in the strict sense, adelgids, and phylloxerids. In this section, we're going to go over aphid ID, or AFID. And this is a web page that has recently been posted, and it concentrates uh, on the morphology and taxonomy of aphids, but it also narrows that concentration down to 66 of the most prolificous and or cosmopolitan species of aphids. So the, the number of aphids that were selected for this particular web page were based upon Blackman and Estop's series of books and their cosmopolitan or their po prolificous species of aphids. But we've also included those polyphagous species that have been most intercepted or intercepted at, at our U.S. ports of entry. So the numbers of species on their list versus uh, the other list for the U.S. intercepted ports were combined. So let's go over about just about how you use this uh, particular tool. Using the mouse here, it's located at aphidnet. Uh, dot org uh, with the web web address right up here, and this is our home page, basically giving you an introduction to the 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 web tool itself. One thing I like about this it is uh, going to the morphology section. It has uh, a section that that not only includes an interactive glossary, and I'll get to that in just a second, but it also has important morphological characters or features that are carried or covered in the in the web tool for the for identification. So let's look at a couple of those different web pages because these are important. You, these are are used in coordination with the web tool, but they these can be used independently as well. Let's look at just the morph to get you started. And what we have here, I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. There we go. The different morphs that are covered in AFID are the wingless adults and the winged adults. And this is a, a wingless adult called an aptera. As you can see, it has no wings, aptly named. And this particular identification page just gives you an idea of what that looks like. And here we have a winged adult. So I mentioned the, the key covers adults. And this is one of the questions that is often asked by students who first get into the study of aphids, is how you tell uh, an adult from an immature, especially given the fact that there are adult, that a, adult aphids that don't have wings. So one of the important characters that you would have to look for is this, um, this genital plate. And this plate is highlighted here, as you can see the arrow that also shows that. And it also shows the rudimentary uh, gonophysis uh, shown here. And so these are the structures that, that uh, distinguish adults from immatures. And again, that genital plate is highlighted. OK, let's go back to some of the other features. Let's look at antenna. The antenna is important structure. Often, different aspects of the antenna are measured, and these are used for identification purposes. So when we talk about the antenna, you can see here the, the various segmentation is is highlighted as we see here in this case it's a six segmented antenna the third antennal segment is often important and why we uh, uh, have enlargements of these illustrations is because to the student you can see exactly what portion of that third antennal segment is measured if it calls for that measurement in the key The last antennal segment is also a very important character for identification of aphids, not only in AFID, but also in a lot of the traditional keys. And this includes the length of the process terminalis, often called the PT, and you want to measure the length of that. 
And you also may want to measure the length of the base. And so uh, this highlights exactly where those parameters are, are measured. Let's take a look at the antennal tubercle. Again, this is another structure that often comes up in the key and also in traditional keys. The antennal tubercles are actually not part of the antennae, they're actually part of the head region. And these are highlighted here, pointing to these structures. In this case, this is a, a, a divergent antennal tubercle. There are usually four stages or four different kinds of tubercles. In this case, the specimen exhibits a parallel tubercle. And you can see that the inner surfaces are nearly parallel here and here. Antennal tubercles are uh, differentiated in relation to the fronds shown here. And this specimen exhibits converging antennal tubercles. You can see that they're actually more or less leaning towards each other as highlighted here. We also have specimens, or sp actually I should say species, that exhibit reduced antennal tubercles. And this photograph shows a good example of that. Again, the antennal tubercle is much more reduced versus the other species that were illustrated. You can see it's lower than the fronds, this portion here. And then the, the last stage is the, or a state is a case where the antennal tubercles are clearly absent, shown here. Let's look at the body in general. In aphidology, some authors will illustrate uh, measurements in different ways in, sense, uh, in the sense that uh, sometimes authors would talk about body length and include the length of the cauda. But in this particular web uh, key, we define the body length as that part from the head to the very tip of the body. And this is just a general illustration of that measurement. And more specifically, we're measuring right here from the middle of the fronds, shown here. And then we go caudally to the tip of the abdomen, shown here. And body measurement does not include the cauda, which is this kind of surfboard looking structure shown in this particular. OK, in, in species where they don't exhibit a, a very large cauda or it's uh, um, basically not discernible, uh, this, it, this shows you exactly how we're, we're making that measurement, again, from the tip of the fronds to the end of the abdomen. I mentioned the caudas, and this is a very important structure for aphid identification. This is a sort of tail, tail piece shown here. In, in this way, it's shaped. Uh, some authors may call this tongue-shaped. The call to measurement is from the base of that structure right here to the very tip shown here. And then the width is measured at that base right across the, uh, uh, the basal portion as shown here. Other structures in the cauda are also important for identification, and that is the number of the CD. And we've just highlighted some of those structures right along the lateral sides of the cauda. Not all caudas are shaped uh, alike. In this case, we have a knob-shaped cauda in which that, instead of a long uh, narrow structure, we have a structure that's indented and, and is more knob-shaped. And this illustrates that. Here you can see um, uh, the structure of that, of that kind of cauda. And there are also dome-shaped caudas. And these are often confused with immature aphids. And that's why the, uh, you have to look for that genital plate to separate the immature aphid from an adult aphid. 
And this shows one of these dome-shaped caudas that could be confused for a, an immature. Again, the measurement is from the base of that cauda, and you also may want to measure the length. Okay? I'm going to go to the head spicule. Head spicules are small projections that are, are located aptly named on the head. In some specimens, you'll have these small projections as highlighted here. In other species, they're, quite more, they're much more prominent, as we have here. And in other species, the spicules are completely absent, and the head area is, is perfectly smooth, shown here. We're going to look at the rostrum. The rostrum is the, the feeding portion of the, the aphid. And an important part is the measuring of this ultimate rostral segment called the URS. And here we highlight exactly how that particular structure is, is measured from the anterior portion right to the tip. Sometimes the number of, of CD are also important in di as a diagnostic cat category. In this, this case, these are called accessory CD, as you can see here. Let's also look at the siphunculus. I like to call these the sort of the, the dual exhaust pipes of the aphid world. And the siphunculus is, is variable in shape depending upon the different species. And some species uh, don't even have siphunculi. Uh, they're completely absent. This highlights a good example of uh, what some folks may call a typical aphid siphunculus. But there are also short siphunculi, as you can see here. The length of those structures, again, are, mo are measured from the base to the very tip. And sometimes in the key, it'll call for a measurement at the midpoint, as highlighted here, or at the basal point, as shown here. Sometimes the siphunculi are swollen. In this case, you can see a constriction more basally where it's uh, widening about halfway down through the, the length of the siphunculus. This is another example of a swollen siphunculus. Again, you'll want to measure, in this case, it looks like the base is sort of uh, at an angle, but you'll want to measure from this point, the furthest point, to the tip. And this, again, shows sometimes uh, in the key it may say uh, with that its widest point, and this would be the measurement parameter you would use in that case. And this is a case where you have a, a conical siphunculus. The siphunculus is greatly reduced. It's on a sclerotized region. Here's a close-up of uh, another species showing this sort of structure. And this uh, shows you the parameters for measurement as well. And in other cases, uh, some, sometimes some species have uh, CD on the siphunculus themselves. And this illustrates those structures, as we have here in Granidia. At the beginning, I mentioned one of the important features of A5D is the glossary. It's, it's an interactive glossary. So let's go to that glossary and just give you some examples. And what we've done here is that all the terms that are used in aphid morphology and taxonomy are included in this glossary. And uh, instead of just defining it with a word that uh, may need further definition, what we've done in cases where the, the word 
within the definition uh, needs explanation, we've hotlinked that within the glossary itself. So in this case, for example, we say we talk about the abdomen as being the third main body region of the aphid, consisting of eight segments. So if you want to know what, is, what we're talking about in segments, you can go right to the segment, and it talks about the definition of that structure. So we find this very useful, especially for the student uh, who is in the ID in the Lucid key, uh, to help explain what terms we're, we're talking about and how they're being used. But these, these, uh, this terminology is also useful in a traditional paper key, let's say, as well. It also has a nice index uh, locator here in the top. So if you have a structure that starts with a, uh, let's say, a, a C, you just click on that, and it goes right to the, uh, the alphabetical part of, of those structures. One of the other features in the key is uh, the linkage to, the, to images. So if you have something where you're talking about the siphunculus, again, where we have a link to the image, you can click on that. And if you're not sure what a siphunculus is, it, it goes right to the morphology page. And again, down through the various variations of the siphunculi. Let's go to fact sheets. I mentioned that we covered 66 species in this particular key. And each one of these species has an individual fact sheet. And these are very helpful to the student because let's click on uh, a surface siphon pisum, the P aphid. So we have the fact sheet where we have the common name. And we include its distribution. Now, we're talking uh, about a lot of cosmopolitan species. So obviously, a lot of these are going to be worldwide. Um, and it's various hosts, including all the different plant families that have been recorded. And we have a little bit on the economic importance of this particular species. And then literature references shown in here. And then you can also go to the taxonomy of this species through aphid species files. So if you want to know all the various synonyms of the P aphid, you can click on that, and that particular link will help show that, as well as various literature on that particular species. One of the features that, that I like to, to show students is the, uh, the portrait gallery, so to speak. So the default for all the species in the fact sheets is the life um, button. And this shows just habitus pictures of the aphid in, uh, in a natural situation. But what you may want to do is click on the All button. And so what this also does is it, it features all the variations of the aphid that are shown in the keys. So you can go to the habitus of the aptera, or the alate, head region, rostral, cauda, siphunculus. But if you just want to look at, let's say, uh, abdominal region for this particular species, let me move down here so you can see how this, this sorts. Just click on abdomen, and then it's sorted just to the abdominal features. And then also, if you want to enlarge this particular, just click on that, and it'll provide an enlargement. So let's go to one of the other, let's say, key characters of AFID, and that is the, the, uh, the lucid key. So you would get to that key from in the key tab by just going to key. And I've preloaded this. And this is what the key would look like. So the lucid key needs a little bit of explanation before you can make this work, uh, or maybe feel comfortable with making it work. This panel shows the, the lucid key itself. And what we have here are we have the entities that are available to us. In this case, 132 uh, entities. Then those would include both, 
both the Aptera and the Alate of the 66 species that are available. And also on, on this panel on the left, you have the characters where you can select in order to prune this tree. So what I'm going to do, where you want to, if you're interested in doing this, you want to click on the filtered source. And that'll be evident here in a second. Let's go back to that. You can expand the, the various characters here. In this case, the thorax expands to leg characters and wing uh, characters. Here's head characters, body characters, etc. So let's just try our first character. Let's say we have a specimen that has wings. So we want to click on the presence of the wings. And once you do that, you prune 67 of the available entities from what was available to you before. So now you have 65 remaining. And at this point, um, you're allowed to do either enter the character that you want to particularly work on, or you can allow the program to enter a character or choose the next best feature that prunes those entities down the quickest. To do that, you want to select this magic wand that's shown here. And so the, the program has selected Antennal 4 Renary account. I neglected to say in the, in the introduction on the fact sheets on the, the sensory structures in, in in aphids are called renaria. And these are small. In some cases, they're transversely located. In other cases, they look almost donut-like along the edge of the, of the segment of the antenna. So it's allowing us to enter this. So you want to click in there. And you have a specific range that you can enter. In this case, it's 0 to 60. So let's put 4 in. So what this has done is it, it has pruned an additional numbers, and we have 15 entities remaining. So let's say we want to allow the, the, um, the program to select the next, next best feature. So it's saying the next, next best feature is antenna 5 or an area. And again, you have a range. So we have 0 to 16. And let's just say 10 on 5. And once you do that, you're down to one remaining entity. In this case, it's the Seroplastes brasiliensis. Now, one of the checks that I always tell folks is to, even though you've come out to a single species uh, remaining, you want to make sure you want to click on this note sheet. And this will take you to the fact sheet and show you Ceratophus brasiliensis, commonly known as a palm aphid. And again, we have the life form here. But because we're working in a microscope situation, you may want to show all the characters or all the pictures available to you. And because we had an A-late, this, this is your time to look at this and do a visual comparison as to whether your species looks much like this. So even, the, even though the key may take you to this very quickly, if, if you're Obviously, if your critter doesn't look like this, then you need to go back and, and reassess your characters, at least the ones that either the, the program has chosen, or you may go ahead and choose your own characters. And also, with um, this feature here, this is not a, a good example, but if we had um, Let's say we go back here, and we're going to change it. And let's say we only had five or six rather than the number we counted originally. We're left with three remaining entities. In this case, you can go back to the fact sheets and check those again. Or you can click on this feature, which is the differences feature. And it'll show you the differences that will separate these particular species from one another. In this case, it's saying the next best feature is going to be the abdomen caudal shape. And the best way to separate it would be through the shape of that cauda, whether it's knob-shaped, dome-shaped. Okay.
So I hope this uh, exercise has been instructional for you to use AFID. And I think that maybe that this will be a good tool for making these identifications. And certainly it, it'll be allow you to use the fact sheets to narrow down some of the descriptions, some of the illustrations, and make comparisons within the microscope. What are some ways to distinguish between the tubercles? So the ways to distinguish between the tubercles, I think this is a case where it's important to, to look at your specimen before you do your slide mounting through a dissecting scope. Sometimes the tubercles, especially when you get to points in the key where you're looking at converging tubercles or parallel tubercles or uh, diverging tubercles, when you have your specimen in a dis under a dissecting microscope, you're able to tilt that specimen up and actually see a little better, in some cases, whether those tubercles are diverging, parallel, or, or converging. And once the specimen is mounted on a microscope slide, sometimes that becomes evident too, but you always run into that problem that the specimen could be twisted slightly or slightly askew, and that presents a problem with the tubercles. So I would say, first off, make sure you take a look at your specimen, obviously, if, if you've just collected it or if you received it. Tilt that specimen in a Petri dish or such that you can see the orientation of the tubercles, and then take a mental note or write it down, and then do your slide mount, and uh, keep in mind um, the, the orientation of those tubercles. And obviously, if you don't see any pronounced tubercles, um, um, if they're not bigger than the, the fronds, that center portion uh, on the head, and so that would be, you would mark that character as absent or, or not well developed. Do all aphids have siphunculi? So do all aphids have siphunculi? One of the, one of the characters of an aphid is the, the presence of siphunculi. And, and to the general public and, and maybe not to the, to the trained eye, um, that's a good character. But interestingly enough, there are aphids that don't have siphunculi. And uh, there aren't many of them, um, but there are um, those species that that character is not present. Can you have wingless adult aphids? So the presence or absence of wings in an aphid um, if aphids have wings, they are adults. If they don't have wings, they can be adults. So the answer to that is you may have adult aphids that don't have wings.